As human beings, we care for ourselves every day. It's part of our natural impulse to survive. When we become a caregiver, we sometimes forget that there is not just one person who needs care. There are two, the person receiving care and the person providing care, the caregiver. Sometimes caregivers become so focused on providing care to another person that they stop caring for themselves. Putting our lives on hold can work when caring for someone with an acute illness like bronchitis because caregiving is short term. When caring for someone who has a chronic progressive illness such as Alzheimer's or cancer, we must prepare ourselves for a long-term commitment. It's important as caregivers to recognize that we too have needs and the right to fulfill those needs. Caregivers who give up activities and relationships that are meaningful to them are at a greater risk for depression, isolation, and health problems. Welcome to Caregiver Wellness. I'm Marian Karpinski and I'll be your host. Caregiving can be a very meaningful experience. It's an opportunity to give love and to be of service. It can also present difficult challenges that leave us feeling exhausted, isolated, and overwhelmed. In this program, we will examine factors that contribute to caregiver stress and offer practical solutions for cultivating lifelong wellness. As many studies have shown, caregivers are vulnerable to stress and have higher rates of depression. 50% of middle-aged women who are caring for their aging parents are diagnosed with clinical depression as compared to 5% in the general population. Caregivers often have difficulty recognizing their stress and depression because of their extreme focus on the care recipient. They are so concerned with how to make that person feel better or how to increase that person's function that they forget themselves. Not only that, most of us were taught to be self-reliant and asking for help was considered a weakness. When caregivers live by this belief, it leads to physical and emotional exhaustion. Stress is part of everyday life. We cannot eliminate stress in our lives, but we can learn ways to manage it. The first step is to recognize the warning signs of stress, which can be different for each person. Stress and tension are very common among family caregivers, as is depression. But many caregivers don't recognize that they're having any of these issues. They feel it's a normal part of taking care of their loved one, and they don't realize when they've gone over the threshold and what they're experiencing is no longer just normal everyday ups and downs, but something more significant that they could use some help with. So some of the signs that a caregiver would look for would be if they're experiencing a lot of tension physically in their body. So let's say they're having more indigestion or stomach cramps, headaches, tension in their neck and shoulders. Uh, thing, ways that they normally would feel it, only they feel it a lot more. Other warning signs of stress are high levels of fear or anxiety, feeling irritable or out of control, resenting the person you are caring for, over or under eating, feeling trapped, difficulty sleeping or sleeping too much, chronic fatigue, excessive use of alcohol, drugs, tobacco, or sugary foods, finding it hard to concentrate or make decisions, withdrawing from people, feeling hopeless. Once you recognize the warning signs of stress, the next step is to identify the cause of stress in order to find solutions. For example, one caregiver may feel pressure or anger because he or she is the only person providing care. For that caregiver, the isolation and lack of support causes stress. Joining a support group, getting respite, or asking for help from family or friends are some possible solutions. Another caregiver might not understand his or her care recipient's disease, and that can be a source of stress and frustration. Expecting a person with Alzheimer's to communicate as he or she once did is unrealistic. Learning more about the disease would help that caregiver to have more realistic expectations. Recognizing the warning signs and the causes of stress is the beginning of making a positive change. Our emotions and feelings can sometimes create stress. You may feel that you are the only one experiencing emotions such as anger, sadness, guilt, 
frustration, helplessness, and resentment. But actually, these are common feelings among caregivers. These emotions can be difficult to deal with, but you can teach yourself a new way of being. We often tend to look at emotions that we consider negative, such as anger, guilt, depression, as being bad. I think what's critically important is that we don't label those emotions as good or bad, but we stop and we look at those emotions because they are telling us something. There's a message um, that we need to stop and listen to and then respond to. The message may be that we're stressed, and that's why we're feeling angry. Um, it, it may be that we are overwhelmed in terms of the caregiving and that a change needs to occur in the caregiving situation. Or the message may be that we are not taking time for ourselves and that we need to step back a bit from caregiving and look at what I can do that I need to do to take better care of me. So the importance of listening what is the message if I'm feeling anger, if I'm feeling resentment, if I'm feeling regret, if I'm depressed? What's the message in that feeling? Even painful feelings can have information that can help us to make positive changes. One of the most common emotions felt by caregivers is guilt. How can I be happy and she's not happy? How can I do things and she can't do things? Uh, it's what you're saying in so many words is guilt. And uh, I was raised with guilt, you know, my religion, we're all guilty. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I feel that way when I'm out with the uh, fellas from the uh, SCORE group or out with the fellas at the uh, uh, support group uh, wondering, is Beth being cared for? Would Beth enjoy this kind of uh, environment? And I know that she's a people person. She's just like myself. Uh, she made lots of parties and entertained the masses here in our house. And now that she can't, I feel guilty that I'm having a good time and she's sitting in, in her recliner with her remote control and that's her life. So yes, I feel guilty. I, I awfully, uh, very often I do it. As a caregiver, it can be so easy to think, how can I go out and have a good time and to do something for myself when my family member is not able to do it? I think it's really important to remember as a family caregiver that if you are taking care of yourself, you're maintaining your friendships and activities that are important to you, you actually bring back more into the relationship. And we know that caregivers who do not become isolated, caregivers who do not become depressed, are able to maintain a more loving and caring relationship with their family member. Guilt tends to be one of the most difficult emotions for a caregiver. Unfortunately, I think what we tend to do as caregivers is to take on guilt for things over which we really had no control. We may have had to make a tough decision. We may have had to limit what our family member um, was able to do because they had Alzheimer's disease and can no longer safely go out and cross the street, for example. Or we may have had to take away um, the keys from a person who was no longer a safe driver. And so often I find as caregivers, we tend to um, put the guilt feelings in this bag on our shoulder and weigh ourselves down. Whereas those were actions that needed to be taken. And it's very important for caregivers to ask themselves, did I do something wrong? Did I purposefully do something to hurt this person? And if the answer is no to that, um, that isn't true guilt that you're experiencing. I think it's important to look at saying, just because I feel guilty doesn't mean I have done something to have those feelings of guilt. Our thoughts directly influence our feelings, behavior, and body sensations. When our thoughts are inaccurate, they contribute to unhappiness and stress. 
there are many different ways to uh, transform negative feelings, but I think one of the most effective that we found in our work with caregivers is to help them learn what thoughts are associated with those feelings. So for example, if you feel frustrated a great deal of the time, you need to ask yourself, what is going through my mind right now that I feel this way? And oftentimes you'll get an answer like, I am, uh, you know, I should be here, I should be there, I should be everywhere, and I'm not, and so I can't please everyone, and so I'm frustrated with myself. That might be the first level of thought. Then the next level, the question would be, well, can you, is this a realistic expectation? Can you really expect yourself to please everyone all of the time, or to be everywhere all of the time, when things happen that you can't control? Is it a realistic expectation? And the individual, usually when they sit back and think about it for a moment, they'll say, well, no, I guess it isn't. So then the next question would be, well, why are you so hard on yourself? Many caregivers think that they must do everything perfectly, but demanding constant perfection of oneself creates stress. To challenge the belief that you must do everything perfectly, ask yourself, is that how I learned other skills like riding a bike, fixing a car, or making lasagna? Most likely you'll find that it took time to learn a new skill, and you learned by trial and error. So you need to look at caregiving the same way. It's a learning process that changes from day to day. Rather than expecting yourself to do everything perfectly, give yourself permission to learn as you go and even to make mistakes along the way. Many caregivers believe they have no control over how they feel about certain situations. The truth is that what happens to us is not nearly as important as how we respond to it. We are free to choose new attitudes even when circumstances may be challenging. In looking at caregiving wellness, one of the most important things as a caregiver is really looking at one's own attitude. If, for example, as a caregiver, I tend to focus on what I can't do, the chances are I'm going to be very stuck and not see that I have any alternatives or, or choices in terms of my caregiving situation versus if I tend to have an attitude of looking at what I can do, what I can change, um, because with that attitude I'm likely to look at solutions to the situation rather than be stuck. Attitude achieves things. Attitude will help you. Likewise with the newcomer, if you will, person that's just Unfortunately, you had a, a loved one that has a stroke or other uh, debilitating diseases, is to give that individual hope. Your attitude determines your altitude in life, and keeping your mind on, on the positives as much as you can, even though there's this adversity facing you, what next type thing. Uh, put your mind at rest, if you will, and look for the good in things instead of the bad in things. Make out the best part of the situation. Now you're going to be able to live closer with that individual, be able to get to know that individual better, and you'll be able to tax some of the things that, that you didn't think you could do, like boil water, <laughs> and learn how to do certain things that were, so to speak, unachievable and, uh, that, it, that you couldn't do. Uh, try to make as much out of the situation as you can. When you lost someone that you love so dear, it is uh, it's not easy to cope with that. So I understand now how people can fall into, into the negativity, you know, or hopelessness. But I'm grateful because I, I took these uh, classes that helped me to understand the process that uh, when you do positive things, it helps you to get out of depression, but depression is fed by negativity. So when you have all these negative uh, things happening to you and you have nothing positive in your life, you just fall into the pit. But when you allow positive stuff get into your life, then it, it really um, gets you out of, of that dungeon, you know, because I call it a dungeon. So I was grateful that I, I learned techniques and ways to, to really be positive and take care of self, you know, in spiritually, uh, physically, and emotionally. 
Making the choice to include positive thoughts and solutions every day doesn't mean that we will never feel sadness or other difficult emotions. Many caregivers experience sadness because of all the losses that occur. If your mother can no longer do what she used to, and now you find yourself taking care of her in ways that she once cared for you, you may feel sorrow. And for most people, that brings a great deal of sadness to realize the potential of that person is no longer there. You know, things are never going to be the way that they used to be. How do we challenge that? Well, we can say to ourselves, this is true. Things are never going to be the way that they used to be. But what can we find now in the present that might really enrich this relationship? What can we do in the moment or say or feel or share with that person so that we're focusing more on the here and now rather than on what is lost, what, you know, what's not there, what is here? And again, by shifting the perspective to what is here, we can help those feelings of sadness because they're not going to take them away, but there may be some joy that we can find in the moment which will help to balance those feelings of sadness. It's normal to feel a variety of emotions throughout the day. If one emotion, such as anger, depression, or fear starts to take over your life, it's time to get help. Seek professional counseling or talk with your doctor. Asking for and receiving help is not something to be ashamed of. All of us need help at some time in our lives. Relaxed breathing is at the core of wellness techniques because it reduces stress and body tension. Relaxed abdominal breathing fills our lungs completely, giving us the energy and oxygen we need. For many of us, when we're under stress, we tend to take in shallow breaths that fill only the top portion of our lungs. Abdominal breathing fills our lungs completely. As babies, we were always abdominal breathing. That's what babies do. You can see their tummies rising and falling. But as we grow older, we tend to forget how to abdominal breathe. So to relearn this skill, the best thing to do is lie flat on the floor, and then take one hand and place it on your upper chest. Take the other hand and place it on your lower abdomen. And then just breathe naturally. Don't force your breath, but see which hand rises when you breathe. If your chest hand rises, then you know you're taking more shallow breaths. But to abdominal breathe, you use your mind to take your breath down deep into your abdomen. And then with each breath, your abdomen rises. Our breath is the essence of our lives. We breathe all the time. Relaxed abdominal breathing is a wellness technique that you can do anytime in any place. Studies have shown that spirituality, including prayer, meditation, and attendance at religious services, has a healing effect, increasing our sense of peace. When we place our attention on a power higher than ourselves, it helps us to lighten the impact of stress on our body and mind. Recent evidence shows that even brief journeys into nature can be soothing and revitalizing. Researchers at Texas A&M University found that patients recovering from gallbladder surgery who could see trees from their rooms needed fewer painkillers and shorter hospitalization than patients whose rooms looked out onto brick walls. Walking in a park, through a field, or sitting beneath a tree gives us time to let go of the focused attention we use when caregiving. Even in an urban setting, and even in short stretches, being in nature can give us needed time for quiet aloneness and inner stillness. Mindfulness-based stress reduction was developed by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, a professor of medicine and a research scientist in mind-body healing. Mindfulness-based stress reduction can benefit those with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, and cancer. Mindfulness practice can be done in a group setting or at home. It is widely used in hospitals across the country because of its health benefits. The value of mindfulness is to allow yourself I define mindfulness as moment-to-moment, -moment, non judgmental non-critical awareness of your thoughts. So what that means is that if I'm following on my thoughts and I'm staying here with uh, an awareness or centering on my breath or my body sensations, 
and then I realize that I've gone off into thinking, um, worry, anxiety, fear, doubt, whatever we want to call it. I've actually left. I've actually left my body, so to speak. So the value and also what I may be doing. So if I'm actually giving care to a person and I've gone off into shopping or gone off into you know, the future about something, I'm not actually present for the person. So the practice is about how can I stay present because the anxiety and the, the quote, stressed on caregivers is when not only you're doing this, but you've also gone somewhere else and you've also gone somewhere else. So if you can keep on coming back to caregiving and then shopping and then whatever, then you stay, you move from moment to moment, which intimately within our physical being allows us to be more present. One of the first directions of mindfulness is an awareness of your body. And I would first just bring your awareness to actually seeing the body sitting here in the chair as a whole, the actual position that it's taking of, of sitting. And then to bring the awareness to the contact of the feet on the floor, the sensation of what that feels like, the buttocks, the back, the elbows, the hands. So the power of mindfulness in this practice, in this process of, of caregiving, is to be able to see that it's when we leave, when we lose ourselves, that caregiving becomes difficult. Caregiving becomes stressful. Caregiving becomes tiring. And if we can be present to what we are doing simply as what we are doing, which is caregiving, by being more present to ourselves, by living um, in this moment, free of all those emotions we've talked about, and start to realize that we do have control over them. We do have the ability to let them go. The exercise system called Qigong is part of traditional Chinese medicine and has been practiced for thousands of years. Medical studies have shown that practicing Qigong improves the immune system, reduces stress, and contributes to longevity. Qigong is really very broad. And Qigong is really a way of life. And that is, uh, qi is, is defined as the vital life force. And gong means the way we work with it. And so, therefore, if it's a vital life force, it affects all aspects of our life. Uh, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, um, spiritually, and how we relate to nature. This is all very, very important. So it can't be broader than that, you know. Qigong can be very simple or it can be very complex. And that's the beauty of it. Because if you have only 10 minutes, you know, a day, uh, some people say they only have that. And you can learn some simple exercise and breathing techniques and do that repetitively and people have gained from that. What we're talking about is the mindfulness of the universal chi, life force, that is always there for us to draw from the universe to help ourselves to heal as well as then we be the catalyst to help the healing of the other person. Yoga is a system of physical postures and breathing exercises that has been used for centuries to calm and rejuvenate the mind and body. Yoga is part of mind-body medicine and is effective for reducing stress and increasing physical and emotional well-being. Taking breaks from caregiving is one of the most beneficial things you can do for yourself. We find that too often with getting breaks, whether it's a formal respite program or it's asking your family and friends um, to be with your family member while you go and do something for yourself, that the major problem is that too often caregivers wait until they're hanging at the end of the rope for a break. And we know that breaks tend to be more healing, um, more beneficial to family caregivers when they plan early in the caregiving process and they take breaks on a regular basis. And they also, during that break time, um, do things that are important to them rather than obligatory 
activities in terms of um, shopping um, for groceries, um, taking care of someone else at the same time. They do something that really fulfills um, themselves as a caregiver. Humor and laughter can lighten a stressful situation. When we laugh, we feel carefree and in control of our environment. The act of laughing is like an internal massage of the body. Laughter allows the release of uncomfortable emotions. Humor plays a part, absolutely. Thank God for humor. Uh, I suppose I'm blessed with humor. It's an automatic thing. I don't have to really work at it. I think I can make humor out of anything. And really, that's probably been uh, the greatest talisman that I have, is being uh, able to uh, uh, bring humor to a situation that is, uh, you know, a facade kind of a thing and reverse it, so to speak, and uh, just put a little touch and loosen up the situation as much, yeah. When my mother was sick, you know, when she couldn't do much in the facility, uh, I used to take uh, old-fashioned movies like Red Skelton and uh, comedians, you know, from Mexico like Antinflas and Tintan. And we, they were very funny movies, so we enjoyed laughing. And, and even though there was no sound in her, in, in because she didn't have any sound, you should see her, her expressions were hilarious. And we, we really laughed a lot, you know. And so that was a way of relaxing. It has been shown that writing about events that affect us deeply and how we feel about them improves mental and physical health. Journaling allows you to discover different parts of yourself and gives voice to what really matters. A journal is a safe place to express yourself. You can vent feelings such as anger without hurting anyone. To get the most out of journaling, date each entry. Keep what you write so you can reflect on it later. Write only for yourself and don't judge what you write. A quick and easy way to start journaling is to do the five minute jump start. Keeping the pen on the paper, write whatever comes to mind without stopping for five minutes. In the midst of caregiving, we are often so focused on providing care that we don't take time to record the precious moments that we share with one another. Writing these moments down will provide you with the keepsake for years to come. Take several deep breaths, then think about a time you shared with your loved one and write about it. Art in the form of sculpture or painting provides a means of expression for feelings that have no words or are not yet understood. Dance, music, and singing can also provide potent tools for creative expression, self-understanding, and healing. Joining a support group allows you to express your feelings and gain knowledge from the experience of other caregivers. It also provides social and emotional support. Other factors that foster well-being include expressing our feelings, having close friendships, learning new skills, caring for ourselves by getting enough sleep, exercising, eating a healthy diet, caring for our body and appearance, and seeking our own medical care. While these factors apply to everyone, it's also true that each of us finds rejuvenation in our own way. It's important for you to identify what makes you feel that your battery has been recharged. Take a moment to think of one or two things that you want to include regularly in your life. Make sure that your choices are simple enough to achieve. Then create an action plan that will help you to bring these activities into your life on a regular basis. Use one action plan for each activity. Creating an action plan is simple. For example, if you want to include a walk with your neighbor once a week, then write that activity with a specific starting date and the steps you need to make that happen. It should look something like this. To help me begin walking with my neighbor by June 8th, I will check with my neighbor to find a time that works for both of us, call my sister and ask if she can watch mom once a week. If my sister cannot help out, then I'll call the local respite services. And four, 
find myself a pair of good walking shoes. Then sign and date your agreement with yourself. Post your completed action plan in a place that you will see every day and work on it step by step. This is an effective way to reach your wellness goals. Caregiving is a life-changing experience. Exactly how it changes your life depends on how you respond to it. One of the greatest challenges for caregivers is recognizing that they have needs and the right to fulfill those needs. The other challenge is the willingness to ask for and receive help. The choice of how to respond is yours. When you choose to care for yourself, it is a gift you give to everyone. Locate support groups in your area by contacting your local area agency on aging, council on aging, senior support services, hospitals, or senior centers. You can learn more about mindfulness-based stress reduction, qigong, and yoga through classes, videotapes, books, the internet, and other media.